from the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Well, good afternoon and welcome to this Friday edition of Washington Watch. I'm your Friday host, Jody Heiss, and an honor to have you on board with us today. We've got a lot coming your way. Let me give you some of the highlights. The escalating violence at the pro-Hamas campus demonstrations all across the country forced President Biden to break his silence yesterday. We are not an authoritarian nation where we silence people or squash dissent. The American people are heard. In fact, peaceful protest is in the best tradition of how Americans respond to consequential issues. But, but, neither are we a lawless country. <clears throat> we are a civil society. An order must prevail. Yeah, so are Democrats worried that a backlash to lawlessness is going to impact the 2024 elections? Well, I'll be talking about that and some other news from Capitol Hill with Texas Congressman Randy Weber here in just a few moments. And last month, you may remember, Congress passed some legislation to ban TikTok from the United States if its Chinese-owned parent company does not divest from the platform. So what is this all going to mean for our nation's ongoing economic rival with the Chinese Communist Party? And perhaps even more importantly, how crucial is controlling data security in all of this battle? That is a huge question. And China expert Gordon Chang will join me a little bit later on to answer those questions. And speaking of battles, the 2024 elections could possibly be influenced by scores, listen to this, scores of leftist non-government organizations who colluded with the Biden administration in a partisan get-out-the-vote effort. Yes, leftist organizations colluding with the Biden administration in a get-out-the-vote campaign. Unbelievable. An investigative story about all of this in the Washington Examiner exposed it all, and I will be talking with the reporter who broke that story, Gabe Kaminsky, a little bit later, so you sure don't want to miss that. And the nation's uh, second largest Protestant denomination, the United Methodist Church, has voted at its general conference this week to abandon Orthodox Christian teachings in favor of of LGBTQ ideology. What in the world led to this doctrinal shift? And how can faithful Christians avoid conforming to the culture in their own lives and in their churches? Well, we'll be discussing this during our weekly worldview segment when I'm joined by Joseph Backholm. He's the Senior Fellow for Biblical Worldview and Strategic Engagement here at FRC. So we've got a lot coming your way. You don't want to miss it. Our website, of course, is TonyPerkins.com. Lots of resources there available for you, as well as archive programs and, of course, this one, if you happen to miss any of it. And just a reminder before we jump into the details of the program that today, underscore today, is the deadline to email the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on and providing your written comments regarding the World Health Organization's power grab before they go to the World Health Assembly, which is scheduled later this month. So if you want to speak up, now is your time. You can text the word WHO to 67742 to find out how you can quickly send an email. That's WHO to 67742, or you can go to frcaction.org slash who to figure out how you can today make your comments heard. All right, so let's jump into our first story for today. Despite efforts to avoid the issue, President Biden responded to weeks of violence and unrest on college campuses yesterday with a brief, a very brief, about three minutes, it was a White House address that attempted to placate both the pro-Hamas demonstrators as well as those who are calling for a return to law and order. Well, all this is coming as administrators on many campuses across the country have literally caved to these protesters' demands. And all of it, frankly, appears to be an effort to make the problem go away, but it certainly is not working, if that's what they were hoping 
to do by caving in to the demands. But with the election now just six months away, in fact, six months today, do these actions indicate that Democrats have begun to panic in fear that the pro-Hamas protests will drive voters away? Well, joining me now to discuss this and more is Congressman Randy Weber. He serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee as well as the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, but perhaps most important for this discussion, he is the co-chair of the House Bipartisan Task Force for Combating Anti-Semitism. Yep, he's leading the charge. He represents the 14th Congressional District of Texas. Congressman Weber, my friend, great to have you back on the program. Thank you, Jody. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. Well, listen, uh, President Biden really was uh, probably forced to uh, kind of speak out finally about the demonstrations that are taking place all across the, the nation. Uh, do you think the, the whole situation finally reached a boiling point that he frankly could just no longer ignore this? Well, obviously it did, Jody. And what was interesting when he said someone to speak something to the effect that we are a country of law and order. I was thinking to myself, well, we, we need a different president then, someone who's not going to cave to the left, someone who's not going to cave to the to the Jew to the Jewish haters, somebody who is going to stand strong for America and our best friend, our ally, Israel. And he's not it. So it's really interesting that he's finally, well, I should say his team has finally decided he needs to speak up. You know, what's what's just uh amazing to me is uh, news reports indicate that the motive behind what I'm about to say is that uh, they, they're hoping that the problem will go away. But in order to do that, it seems that many college administrators have caved to their protesters' demands. Uh, you know, this is probably a, just a, a common sense kind of question, but what happens if you reward these protesters for violating the law? Well, it's the old saying, when you reward bad behavior, good behavior, you get more good behavior. Guess what? When you reward bad behavior, you get more bad behavior. Jody, there's been 40, latest count, 48 universities across this country. And if you looked at a map, and I don't know if you have or not, but really only about 11 of them are in the West, starting at Texas and going to the, to the West Coast. Most of it is in the East. A lot of those liberal bastions of liberality, the colleges where all these students go to get indoctrinated by their professors, sadly, and they don't get taught history. They don't get taught about you know Hitler and the Nazis and the anti-Semitism and uh, the Holocaust and all those things that cropped up. And you know the saying, never again. We're not teaching our students that we cannot allow this to happen again. In fact, as you point out, in many cases, the, the liberal professors are actually teaching that we should not be the friend of Israel, and this is, you know, good common behavior. All these protests, it's it's unnerving. Yeah, unnerving to say the least. Uh, yeah, I, I really, I guess the bottom line for Congress in all of this is that you you all pass the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. And here you are as the co-chair of that House Bi uh, Bipartisan Task Force for, for combating anti-Semitism. Give me your reaction to this um, uh, anti-Semitism act that was passed. Well, obviously, you know how many Democrats voted against it. And it should no surprise to us. What we're basically saying is, look, we're not stopping free speech. We're saying these are the signs of anti-Semitism that we should be aware of. These are the things that should be condemned. We actually, there, we actually have some language in there for the Department of Education that says they can bring these up as a concern. And I like the comment earlier about we should take be taking money away from these colleges. Uh, you know, not in the Texas House, the more on the public education committee, the more money we gave in education, the higher the professor's salaries went and the higher tuition went. And we shouldn't be standing for that especially now when we are at a pivotal time in our nation, in our country, in the world's history, really. I guess you saw the other day or a day or so back, Jody, that Turkey has cut off all trade with Israel. You're starting to see countries in the Middle East come against Israel. It's it's pretty, pretty unnerving in some fashions. 
Yeah, I do want to bring that up. I'm glad you did about Turkey. I want, I want to get your opinion on that. But before we do, I wanted to uh, uh, put a clip up. You mentioned uh, the free speech that the, the bill this past week did not do anything away with free speech. But uh, Jerry Nadler, Nadler on the House floor, he said something else. Let me play this clip three and get your response to this. This bill will do nothing to help stamp out anti-Semitism on campuses or anywhere else. But it will threaten free speech. And those of us who support it, who oppose anti-Semitism and support freedom of speech ought to vote no on this bill. All right, your reaction to that? You know, it is astounding to me that at this, I mean, this is a time in history that I'm 70 years old, I've never seen anything like this. And of course, as you know, our forefathers lived through this. My dad was one of the last of the greatest generation of World War II. They watched this unfold in Nazi Germany and, and under Hitler. And while we are sitting here trying to say never again by doing some things, defining some of those acts, exhorting our colleges and our professors to pay attention, we're not saying that those people cannot talk. We're just saying, look, these are certain acts that ought to be looked at and decide if there's a tendency to lead to violence. And if there is, then we want the Department of Education to take note of that and make certain that there's plenty of security on the ground. Now, think about all the security that we have to put up, Jody. Who's paying for the manpower, the police that have to be there away from their jobs, away from their families, you know, the regular jobs, I guess I should say, their day, their beats. And they're having to be there to protect college students who are, who are seem bent on just tearing up a college, trashing it completely. It makes no sense to me that Jerry Nadler and others would say no, except that they don't want Republicans to get a win. They want this president in the White House, who's been critical of Israel, to stay, stay in the White House and get the votes. And so they're not going to vote for a Republican. And actually, it's a bipartisan bill, but they want Biden to stay in the White House and keep his pressure on Israel to, for a ceasefire. It, it's mind numbing. It is. Well, listen, I, when I ask this question, we're only going to have about a minute left, but you brought up Turkey, uh, and I, I want to get your reaction to this. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken uh, actually admitted that the, the barrier to peace in the Middle East right now is Hamas. They're refusing to, uh, to, to any of the negotiations. But then we have Turkey uh, suspending their trade with Israel. We have Colombia severing diplomatic relations. Does it seem like Hamas is benefiting from these other countries rejecting uh, their relationship with Israel. Is Hamas benefiting from all this? Well, that's the propaganda. That's what you're seeing is all the propaganda. That's what started, as you know, in World War II, way, way back in, before World War II actually got started, up and running. And you're seeing the same kind of propaganda. And yes, Hamas is benefiting from that. And when I get people, whether they're pro-Palestine or pro-Hamas in the hallway, stop me and say, what do I think about Israel attacking you know, the Gaza Strip and women and children getting killed. I, my response is, look, Israel was attacked and Israel is responding. We wouldn't want Israel or anybody else telling us how to prosecute our war if somebody attacked us. We shouldn't be telling Israel how to prosecute right. their war. Congressman Randy Weber, thank you so much for your insight into all of this and have a great weekend yourself. All right, friends, coming up after the break, Gordon Chang is going to join me to discuss how data control has emerged as the next battleground in the economy. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. In light of Israel's national security, global political and spiritual challenges, it is abundantly clear that the people of God must visibly demonstrate our unwavering support for Israel, support which is anchored in the Word of God. To do this, we're calling on and inviting Bible-believing Christians in every place of worship on Sunday, May 19th, to dedicate time to pray for Israel's peace, prosperity, and protection. With thousands of churches and communities collectively raising their voice to the Lord on behalf of the people of Israel, this unified cry will serve as a powerful testament to the world of our shared belief and the importance of standing alongside the Jewish people. For more information, and to commit to praying for and standing with Israel on Sunday, May 19th, visit PrayAndStand.com. That's PrayAndStand.com for more information.
most underscored scripture in the Bible is this scripture. John 15 and 5, Jesus speaking, for without me, you can do nothing. This is not about sucking it up. It's not about pulling up your bootstrap. It's about turning from this to something, someone, and his name is Jesus, who enables us and empowers us to be the men of God that he's called us to be. Brothers, listen to me. You have been endowed with authority from heaven to put your hand up against all of the forces of darkness that is coming against you and against your household. And if you will use that rightful authority, God himself will stand in back of it. God has given you, as the parent, as the father of your children, the responsibility and the authority to teach your children. You are not to outsource that to your wife or to your pastor. You are the spiritual leader of your home. You will never be faithful in serving your calling if you're not faithful in your family relationships. It just won't happen. I don't need entertainment. I don't need opinions. I don't need a soft message. I need the Bible. I came to hear the Word of God today. That's what we need today, the Word of God. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your Friday host, Jody Heiss, and welcome aboard. Glad to have you. You just saw a commercial ad, but let me just underscore it again. May the 19th, we just talked about all the issues happening in Israel, and we are taking time to pray for Israel and encouraging churches to do so all across the country on May 19th. We'll talk a little bit more about that as the program unfolds. But to find out more, go to PrayAndStand.com, PrayAndStand.com, or you can simply text the word uh, Israel to 67742. Please join us. Israel needs it. This is an important issue. All right. When President Biden signed legislation to ban the social media app TikTok in the uh, United States if its Chinese owners do not divest from the company, that signaled that data security has moved to the forefront of the continued economic rivalry that's taking place between the United States and China. And of course, as all of our modern devices continue to gain the ability to both generate and transmit data, industry experts predict that TikTok is going to emerge as just one of many Chinese-controlled companies that lawmakers are going to target. Well, joining me now with his thoughts on all of this is Gordon Chang, a distinguished senior fellow at the Gatestone Institute. He's the author of China is Going to War and the Great U.S.-China Tech War. And as just a way of reminder, and I encourage you to follow him at on X, former Twitter, under the handle at Gordon G. Chang. Uh, this is one that you definitely want to follow if this is a topic of interest, which it should be. Gordon, welcome back to Washington Watch. Always great to have you. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jody. All right. So this whole topic of data security, why is this such a major concern? Well, China is vacuuming up who, uh, of uh, data from around the world, not just the United States. And it's using it uh, for various purposes. One of them, of course, you know, is just economic. And, uh, but the most important thing, though, it is using it against the United States. It is getting information in which to blackmail Americans. It does that through TikTok. Remember, TikTok is on 170, devices, 170 million devices, which means that Beijing is getting information about more than half the American public on just one platform. And as you point out, there is more than just TikTok. But it's using this um, in a way that is targeting the United States, and we just can't permit that. This is more than just economics. This really is, goes to national security. Okay, we've got a proposal for what's being called the Clean Network, designed to prevent Beijing from accessing the personal uh, data of Americans. What's your take on how the Biden administration has been handling all of this? Well, the Biden administration knows of the problem. And every once in a while, it does something about it, but really it doesn't have its heart in it um, because we need to show the same determination in protecting our data as the Chinese uh, show in stealing it. Um, we have known for a very long time that China, for instance, uses TikTok. They've violated every pledge that they've made to the United States on data security. 
They violated U.S. laws by stealing data. And, you know, the president's response has been to put his campaign for re-election on TikTok. He did that memorably during the Super Bowl this year. So it shows you a lack of seriousness on the part of the administration. And while I'm glad that he did sign the TikTok bill last month, the point here, though, is that he extended the deadline for the sale of TikTok until after the November 5 election. So that shows you what Biden is thinking. Wow, that's an I had, I had forgotten that on the Super Bowl. That's a, a good thing to remember. You know, there's a lot of commentators out there that somehow are trying to paint a story of equivalence between China and the United States when it comes to the citizens' data. But are they really comparing apples with oranges here? Yeah, there is no comparison. You have to remember, we're a very different society than China. Um, China is a communist state. It's top down. No Chinese individual, no Chinese entity can disobey an order from the Communist Party. So when ByteDance, for instance, the Chinese owner of TikTok, says, well, it would never provide data to the Communist Party, well, it has no choice but to do that. Um, you know, in our country, uh, big tech platforms, yeah, they collect data like TikTok does. But uh, if they want to, and they often do, they resist uh, requests from the federal government about supplying data. So we're a very different society, and I don't think that there is any equivalence here. Yeah, great point. You you brought up ByteDance, the, the company that owns TikTok, and you know it, it was interesting to me that they have said that they would prefer to shut down U.S. operations instead of selling. I think that tells us everything we need to know about all of this. Uh, before I let you go, our time is about to run out. Before I let you go, there's one more item I wanted to get your insight on. China has said that they they will respond to the U.S.'s recent military aid to Taiwan. What in the world do you think that could possibly mean for the U.S.? Well, they're going to huff and puff about Taiwan. Um, you know, they're going to send their planes across the median line in the Taiwan Strait, which is the boundary. They'll send their ships close to Taiwan. But what we really need to keep our eye on is what they're doing at Second Thomas Shoal and Scarborough Shoal in the Philippines, in the South China Sea, because there they're engaging in really belligerent activities, some of which constitute acts of war. And they're doing that in defiance of America's warnings that we are prepared to use force against China to discharge our obligations pursuant to our mutual defense treaty with the Philippines. That's the really the great flashpoint right now. And that's what I think China means when it says it's going to impose costs on us. Do you think this is going to lead, Ren, we all have a, a less than a minute, do you think this is going to lead to a military conflict? I think so, um, because we have to ask a question. And that is, whenever has a militant state with expansive territorial ambitions engaged in fast military buildup and not gone to war? Well, it's disturbing when you look at what's happening really all across the world right now. I mean, we not the least of which is our own southern border, but then you have what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Israel and the Middle East, and then what's happening now yeah, with China and Taiwan. It really is a very disturbing situation. Thank you, Gordon Chang. It's to always fantastic to speak with you and get your insight. We appreciate it very much. Well, thank you so much, Jody. All right, have a great weekend. All right, friends, after the break, we have an investigative report. You don't want to miss this. An investigative report is revealing how leftist organizations are colluding with the Biden administration to influence the 2024 elections. We'll talk about it in our election segment for this week, right after the breaks. Stay right where you are. We'll be back in a moment. America was a bright light until the culture gave into darkness. But we won't. We are in a battle for the soul of our nation, between right and wrong, between truth and lies. At a time when the mainstream media is blocking Americans from truth, millions are searching for a source of trustworthy news that shines a light in the darkness. At this time of great need, FRC is lighting the way forward. 
For 40 years, Family Research Council and its partners have stood together to advance and defend biblical truth in government and culture. Between our flagship broadcast program, Washington Watch, with Tony Perkins, to our news outlet, The Washington Stand, FRC is providing believers across the country with news they can trust from a biblical worldview. When you stand with FRC, you help light the way forward for America and the next generation. Go to frc.org slash give. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. Thank you for joining us today on Washington Watch. Welcome back. I'm your Friday host, Jody Heiss, and an honor to be with you. All right, and one more time, well, I'll probably say it again before the program's over, but don't forget, May 19th is an important day as we are going to be calling on churches all across America to pray for Israel. Uh, you can find out more about all this by going to PrayAndStand.com or simply texting the word Israel to 67742. Again, we'll have a little bit more of that in a moment. All right, big news. According to an investigative report from the Washington Examiner, in the summer of 2021, a cadre of leftist non-government organizations colluded with top Biden administration officials to implement President Biden's recent executive order that granted such organizations uh, recruitment tools when it comes to voting. Now, these NGOs, as they're called, non-government organizations, these NGOs include groups such as the disgraced Southern Poverty Law Center. They coordinated with the highest levels of the Biden administration to initiate a partisan get-out-the-vote effort. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Gabe Kaminsky. He's the investigative reporter for the Washington Examiner who reported on all this. Gabe, well, welcome to Washington Watch. It's an honor to have you. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Thanks. All right, well, so let's start with this executive order that was issued by President Biden. Uh, what did it do? Yeah, President Joe Biden in 2021 signed an executive order, a sweeping, unprecedented voter registration-related order, voter mobilization executive order, authorizing agencies to, to uh, prioritize uh, registering voters directly and also to work with uh, quote unquote, approved nonprofit organizations on a nonpartisan basis under federal law uh, uh, to register voters across the country. Now, what we had uncovered at the Washington Examiner is that uh, uh, the Biden administration, the White House, and the Department of Justice, and, and other uh, top agencies actually held a meeting after this executive order was signed in the summer of 2021 with a uh, whole cadre, as you mentioned, of organizations to discuss voter registration and how something like that would look in the future. What we uncovered and what is apparent through those documents is that the organizations involved in planning and coordinating on this executive order all share one thing in common. They all are left-leaning. They're all, some of them are more progressive, in fact. And that's something that conservative groups like the Heritage Foundation uh, or the Foundation for Government Accountability, these uh, you know influential conservative think tanks, they're concerned about. That's something that they worry about ahead of the 2024 election, that potentially there could be a partisan operation to essentially work through the federal agencies, through taxpayer dollars, to get uh, voters to vote for President Joe Biden and Democrats. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And they claim this is nonpartisan. It is partisan through and through, not even a, a, 
uh, nothing but left-leaning and leftist organizations like the SPLC, for example, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. How did they come into all of this? The SPLC is one of these organizations that was involved in this uh, since reported meeting that took place at the White House, along with groups like the George Soros funded Open Society Policy Center, Black Voters Matter, a group that was very active in 2022, getting Democrats elected in Georgia, uh, as I mentioned, SPLC, a whole campaign legal center, a left wing watchdog group. And so the concern from right of center groups, right, is you know, you you want your government to act in a nonpartisan fashion. There, there's a concern among people, um, uh, conservatives particularly, that this is going to be used, this sort of operation to register Democrats across the country or register voters in places where Democrats uh, uh, would be, more, people would be more likely to vote for for the Democratic Party. So what about the Hatch Act? I mean, I, there's got to be people out there asking about that. This, of course, uh, prohibits federal employees in the executive branch from engaging in uh, all sorts of forms of political activity. Are these nonprofits somehow trying to run interference uh, just for the appearance sake uh, to maybe look like the Hatch Act is not being violated? I think that is a concern of members of Congress, that this could violate the Hatch Act, which prohibits certain political activities for the executive, for, for federal officials. Now, the other thing I would point to is the Anti-Deficiency Act. Uh, that's an act uh, uh, that prohibits federal agencies from, from acting in ways external to congressional appropriations. In other words, uh, uh, there's concern from lawmakers that taxpayer dollars are being used in a way that they are not uh, already authorized. It, um, that's something that Hans von Spakovsky had mentioned to me at the Heritage Foundation, and that's something a lot of people are concerned about. Uh, and so there's certain laws that that uh, that that I think could become uh, you know more relevant certainly as as lawmakers look into this and uh, as potentially courts courts you know take up certain cases. Well, it looks to me like the Biden administration somehow is just banking on the legacy media. Uh, to just ignore all the violations and uh, to not to raise a fuss about it at all in hopes that it'll all go away. Well, I just want to personally say, uh, Gabe Kaminsky, thank you for the incredible investigative reporting that you've done on this there at the Washington Examiner. Uh, great job. And thank you for taking time to join us here on Washington Watch. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. All right, friends, much more coming straight your way. Uh, after the break, I'm going to be joined by Joseph Backholm. Uh, he, of course, is with our Biblical Worldview Center for Biblical Worldview. But we're going to be discussing some news that came out this week, including this, that the nation's second largest Protestant denomination, they have reversed their teachings on marriage, sexuality, and they've started ordaining LGBT clergy. You don't want to miss what's coming your way right after the break, so stick around. The Lord reigns. Let America rejoice. From coast to coast, let justice reign. Peace reign, righteousness reign. Lord, let it reign. May the clouds of blessings gush and rain down upon us. Yet even in the clouds, we see the light of your face. Make your face shine on these states, we pray. We pray and then we work. We work in the strength you provide. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Strengthen our hands to do all to God's glory. Whether we eat or drink or vote, everything is holy. So we vote to God's glory. We vote because we can. We vote because we love our nation. We vote because we love our people. The people rejoice when the righteous rule, but when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Adorn our land with oaks of righteousness. Place men, place women, place those in authority who know their place, who know that they are under authority. Men and women who will stand for the true, for the good, for a more beautiful America. But how can they stand if we don't stand? We must stand. Lift us up. Help us stand. Raise us to that summit, which is yourself. 
for those you raise to that summit do not fall. You are able to keep us from falling. Until that day when we do fall, fall before your throne, where our King reigns now. Now, let us rejoice and pray, vote, stand. Amen. Jesus said in John 15, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. In 2024, in these divided and uncertain times, how can this be possible? By abiding in him through his word. At Family Research Council, we wanna help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. In just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But more importantly, you will be abiding in him daily. Find our Bible reading plan at frc.org slash Bible. And join Tony Perkins each weekday for a 10-minute devotional inspired by the daily reading and designed to encourage you on this journey through the Bible. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And remember, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Good afternoon and welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your Friday host, Jody Heiss, and an honor to be with you today. All right, as the Bible teaches, it's imperative for Christians to stand with and to pray for Israel. And here at FRC, as you probably know by now, we're calling on believers to commit to praying for and standing with Israel. And we're specifically calling on Bible-believing churches to do so collectively on Sunday, May the 19th. We're asking churches to come together on that day and dedicate a portion of their worship service to pray for Israel's peace, for their prosperity, and for their protection. To learn more and to sign the pledge, I want to encourage you to visit PrayAndStand.com, PrayAndStand.com, or you can simply text the word Israel to 67742. Again, this is an important time. And we're asking all churches to come together. Let's collectively pray for Israel. And thank you in advance for helping us with that. Okay, as you probably know by now on this program, we often discuss the importance of Christians remaining rooted in the Word of God. I mean, after all, how can we stand for truth if we're not immersed in it? This past week, just as an example, the United Methodist Church's General Conference was held in Charlotte, North Carolina, and they provided a look at what can happen when a church body drifts away from the orthodoxies that are clearly taught in Scripture. And specifically, perhaps for those of you who may not have heard, the uh, UM Church is the nation's second largest Protestant denomination, and they reversed their teachings on marriage, sexuality, and the, even the ordination of LGBTQ clergy. It's pretty stunning for many of us to think about where the United Methodist Church has come. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Joseph Backham. He's the Senior Fellow for Biblical Worldview and Strategic Engagement here at the Family Research Council. Joseph, great to see you. Welcome back to the program. Good to see you, Jody. All right, well, let's start at this. I'm sure some of our viewers uh, some of our listeners right now probably shocked it. Uh, perhaps it's the first they've heard. But in basic terms, explain for us what took place in the United Methodist Church's general conference. Well, their conference got together and essentially voted to overturn the church's longstanding policy on homosexuality. And they did a couple of things. Is One, they said that it is no longer the church's position that it is uh, immoral. And of course, that's inconsistent with what the Bible says about the subject. But in addition to that, because they had determined it was no longer immoral, therefore, uh, they would ordain a clergy. And that was a, it seems like a revolutionary position, but in some ways, this outcome was kind of a foregone conclusion because the church had really been debating this 
for a long time within the denomination. And in the la- over the last couple of years, more than 7,000 churches left the United Methodist denomination specifically over this issue. There was a schism. There were more conservative churches that thought they could win a vote. It turns out that they were actually in the minority, so they ended up leaving the denomination in in areas like around the Dallas, Texas area. More than 70% of the United Methodist churches that were then part of the denomination actually left. And again, 7,000 total churches left over this issue. So the churches that remained were the ones who had essentially abandoned the biblical position on these issues. So when they all got together, essentially having purged the denomination of those who were actually Christians, um, at that point, it was uh, it was actually kind of an easy and, uh, I suppose, predictable outcome. Yeah, I specifically, I remember what you're talking about last year, uh, more or less, I think across the denomination, you say some 25% of the UMC churches uh, left the denomination Right. And those who remain pretty much were here. So are you saying that it was there for because of what happened last year, this was uh, just like a mad rush into the LGBTQ ideology that this was inevitable for yeah. them? Well, in some ways, this was probably the climax of that. The denomination had been debating it for a while, and that was uh, part of that debate, and actually probably the latter part of that debate uh, was the result of all those churches leaving. So essentially it's, you know, to, to create maybe a crude analogy, if you have America where uh, all of the Democrats have left and then the Republicans hold an election, then you're not going to be surprised what the outcome of that election is. So in similar ways, that's kind of what happened within the denomination. There was a split on the issue. All the people who kind of held the historic biblical Christianity on the issue were no longer allowed to vote because they had left the denomination. Therefore, the only people that remained for the most part, and it wasn't a unanimous decision, but it was a super, super majority. Um, I, I think the number, if I can get it right, I can find it here. Um, it's 692 to 51 was the ultimate vote. So there were some, there are some holdouts still within the denomination, but that of course is an overwhelming super majority of people to abandon the biblical position on the issue. It sure is. Well, I, I wanted to to read this and get your reaction. One of the pastors who advocated for this change uh, gave this explanation to justify the reversal of this uh, decision. He said, cynics and young adults will not listen to us talk about Jesus if we say we do not condone people they love and care about. What do you make of that kind of logic? Well, they won't listen to us talk about Jesus. And uh, it's important that if somebody does listen to us talking about Jesus, that we are talking to them about the actual Jesus. And I would argue what the, uh, the, the remaining United Methodists are arguing for is creating a fictional Jesus that doesn't really exist and presenting that Jesus in the hope that their audience likes that Jesus better. And of course, what have you accomplished if you've done that? Not much from a gospel perspective, because the Jesus that you're offering them is a figment of your imagination and your dreams. And so I don't know that you've accomplished anything there. Uh, We as Christians, we do want uh, to, of course, evangelize, tell people about Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that is the way that we are reckoned. He is the path through which we are reconciled to God. And we can uh, deal with our sin problem. And that's, of course, a very important that people meet Jesus. But they have to re- meet the real Jesus. And the way they meet the real Jesus is if they have an encounter with the real Jesus. And Jesus does not need us to amend his teachings, amend his doctrines, his way of life, uh, to obscure what he said about himself, uh, to obscure what he said about sin and our sin problem and how to deal with that as a way to make him more palatable uh, to people. That, of course, is not our responsibility. And as disciples, it's our job to present him as he actually presents himself. And then people will have to deal with him as he presents himself. Um, But the concern here is, of course, that we are not doing that, that the United Methodist Church and the argument that that pastor makes is that we modify a version of Jesus and present him to the world, hoping they like him better. And even if you're successful in that, you haven't accomplished anything. Well, 
Great point, and uh, I love the way you brought that together. I, I want to change topics and shift to something else, but before we do there, I, Joseph, I want to bring this down to where most of us are living and the churches in which that, that we attend. How, as Christians, but we can't avoid uh, this cultural drift. This is happening. It is coming to our churches, regardless of what type of church we attend. Uh, it's coming to many of our own lives and families. It's, it's in our culture. So how do we as Christians deal with this uh, in a Christ-loving, biblical manner? Yeah, well, there is cultural change. That's that's uh, certain. I mean, that, that's obvious, I suppose, is the better word there. Um, the, the culture is changing, but God is not changing. And you know, it's the old hymn that a lot of us have has sung, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When there is a rock, um, that is a foundation uh, in an environment where things around it are changing, but it does not move. And so we as Christians, if we are anchored to the truth, there can be wind and there can be currents and there can be shifting sand and all of those things, but we don't need to be moved by those things. And that's really the test. The culture has always changed. That is not a new phenomenon. The disciples experienced that phenomenon. Jesus lived through that experience, through a culture that was not entirely receptive to the reality of the gospel and what that meant for the culture that we lived in. So none of that is new. And, and so we as believers, we need to come to terms with the fact that conflict with the world is part of the cost of discipleship. It's not new. That's what happened to Jesus. Not everybody loved Jesus. That's why they killed him, right? Because the things that he believed and testified to uh, threatened the dominant cultural structures and the, and, the, and the power structures of that particular religious um, environment and, and culture. And that's why they didn't take kindly to everything Jesus had to say. And that's always been true. That's why 11 of the 12 disciples uh, were murdered, uh, were martyred is probably the better, is certainly the better word. Uh, and the one who wasn't martyred survived being boiled alive twice because the gospel has implications that people don't appreciate when they want to be in charge of themselves and other people. Universal submission to God is a message that much of humanity does not take kindly to. And so we just need to understand that that conflict is natural. It's to be expected so that when we see it happen, we don't decide, well, I need to uh, change what God actually said. I'm going to modify the gospel uh, to make my life easier, which is, I think, in significant ways what the United Methodist Church has tried to do. Well, you know, when you look at all of this, it's, uh, it, this is not just happening in churches. I mean, as you, sh you say, the culture is changing. And if I can, let me just use this to shift topics just a little bit, but not too, too far. Uh, earlier this week, a federal appeals court ruled that the state health insurance plans in both North Carolina and West Virginia must now provide coverage for gender procedures. And so now we're seeing it from the insurance side coming in to play in these states. Uh, your thoughts on this? Well, this is a really interesting uh, decision on a, on a number of levels. And I would say the most significant for me when I read through this opinion and kind of the worldview implications of this is the state of North Carolina argued that one reason they should not have to pay for these uh, surgeries and uh, hormones is because there's not evidence that they actually help the people that they claim to help. And the eight, in the Fourth Circuit, the eight judges in the majority they dismiss that by saying, if there's no evidence for the argument that it's not helpful, you can't raise that argument. And what's interesting about them saying there's no evidence for that argument is just a couple of weeks ago, the national health services in the United Kingdom, they made the decision that they were no longer going to provide cross-sex hormones for minors. Why? Because there was no evidence that it was helpful. Just one year ago, Sweden did the same thing. And this is, is significant because Sweden 
was the first country to begin performing transgen so-called transgender surgeries uh, back in the 1970s. And they have now said, hey, we're not going to do this anymore on minors. Why? Because there's no evidence that it's helpful. They are, as the left likes to say these days, in fact, following the science. But we have the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals judge judges here in the United States essentially putting their fingers in their ears, it seems, saying, you can't make that argument if there's no evidence for it, when the reality is the consensus around the globe is moving in the direction of it's not helpful, and yet they have the audacity to say that there's no evidence for an argument that actually is kind of winning the day around the globe. So I think that's an illustration of the fact, and again, we're, we're talking about kind of worldview here, of what happens when you no longer become interested in the truth, is we choose willful ignorance. And there's all sorts of ways that we as individuals do this. It's like those, those facts are inconvenient. They would cause me to re consider the thing that I want to be true. Therefore, I will deny knowledge of the things that challenge the premise upon which I am building my belief system or even my entire life. And so ignorance is something that we choose as humans when we don't like the implications of the facts. And that's what it appears that the Fourth Circuit did. Wow. Well, listen, we've only got uh, a little over a minute left, but I, one of the judges, Roger Gregory, uh, writing in the majority opinion here, uh, said that denial of coverage was discriminatory. Uh, is that just a willful denial of the elective nature of these surgeries? I mean, how do you take this? It's not an issue of discrimination, yeah. is it? Well, what they said is that if a state is willing to provide a mastectomy, so cut off the breasts of a woman who has cancer, it is discriminatory to not cut off the breasts who wants to look, of a woman who wants to look more like a man. Now, everybody would look at that scenario and say there is a obvious, meaningful difference between cutting off or removing uh, a body part that has cancer and removing a healthy body part. But again, going to the worldview of this, the, the court, and that judge in particular, by referring to this as discriminatory, um, denies that difference and essentially says the justification is the desire. So we're no, no longer going to apply reason up to and including medical knowledge about the situation, but the desire for that surgery is what makes it necessary, and therefore to not provide it when the desire is present, that's discriminatory. It's insane, but that's where they're at. Wow. Joseph Packham, uh, Senior Fellow for Biblical Worldview and Strategic Engagement here at FRC. Thank you so much for your incredible insight on this and for all that you do at FRC and beyond with Biblical Worldview. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Jetty. All right, friends, that wraps up another edition and yep, another week of Washington Watch. Hope you have a fantastic weekend. Keep your eyes focused on the Lord. Walk with Him. We'll see you next week right here on Washington Watch. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.